just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when I need him just when I need him. Just when I need Him most. Jesus cares and cares for me. I know Jesus cares and cares for me. He hears when I call. He knows when. Just when I need Him, He is my all. Answering when upon Him I call, tenderly watching lest I should fall. Just when I need Him most, just when I need Him most, just when I need. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when I need Him, just when I need Him, just when I need Him Timothy 2 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 15. This is a verse that uh, you have probably heard before, but isn't it great to realize that no verse in Scripture can ever be overused or overworked? And tonight we're looking at, uh, as we continue through our series on life's journey and keeping in mind, kind of running alongside of that Pilgrim's Progress, as Pilgrim came through his last adventure, he met up with a group of shepherds. And we're going to introduce you to them this evening. But as he looked at this group of men, the, the references that were made were comparing those shepherds to our pastors. Now, what do you expect out of a pastor? You know, that could be, depending on how that's phrased, that could be taken a couple of different ways, couldn't it? What do you expect out of your pastor? For some, that might be who knows what. You never know what to expect out of the pastor. 
And others have a list of expectations that they feel like are, are not only biblical, but personal. And I think everyone that attends a church has an expectation of their pastor. And again, some of those we find in, in certain instances are well within the framework of what Scripture has. And others, sometimes a pastor gets stretched beyond their measure by the expectations of those that are in their congregation. But we're going to take a look at tonight at some of the aspects that a pastor should employ and some of the expectations not only of people, but of Scripture itself. Do you want just anybody to be a pastor? Some guy walks up one day, no lie, I met a guy, he came and visited our last church and he uh, brought up afterwards a certificate and presented it to me. He said, I just want you to know that I'm a pastor too. As I got to looking at the certificate, it didn't really have the normal information on it. It seemed rather odd. I went home and looked it up on the internet, and that's where I found his certificate. He had gone on the internet and put his name into a certificate that said that he was certified as a pastor. And he was just full of, of energy and ready to go and said, you know, I preach at people's churches all the time. If you ever need a preacher, just call me. Here's my certification. That was a new one for me. And so he didn't ever show up again, so I guess he realized I didn't recognize the certificate. But that's a possibility these days. And anybody could walk up with a certificate and say, Hi, I'm the pastor. So what beyond the certificate makes a pastor a pastor? 2 Timothy 2.15, one of the things that a pastor should possess is knowledge. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's a couple of key factors in there. Study to show thyself approved. There is a, a busyness that comes with being a pastor. And there are many pastors who feel quite within their realm to simply stand up. Remember in speech, the impromptu? They would have you draw some piece of paper out of a bowl or a hat and you would be assigned that topic. You had about three seconds to get ready for it, and then guess what? You had to start talking. And it had to look like you knew what you were talking about. And unfortunately, in ministry today, there are a number of people who are extremely good at impromptu speaking, and so that becomes their mode of operation. What should I preach on this week? I have people ask me all the time, how do you come up with sermons? I don't have a list, and I don't look at people and say, you know what, he hasn't had a message on him lately, so I need to... It's probably about his turn. Now, I have people come up and ask if I've been sitting in their house listening, and I promise I haven't. But it's amazing how God will take His Word and the preparation used by going through that Word in so many different ways. But that pastor has to be willing to study. I had a class that I had to go to the other night, and one of our young girls found out that I went to class and told my wife that he's way too old to be going to school. You know, a pastor should never be too old to study. Too old to begin to realize that there is so much beyond what we know that is available for us to learn. How can someone teach something that they don't know? The ability to spend time studying and learning and growing. If a pastor reaches a point in his life and in his ministry where he feels like he's reached maturity, the climax of maturity, and have you met people who just knew it all? And sometimes pastors can maybe come across that way. Well, who does he think he is? Wow, well, does he think he knows everything? not by the farthest stretch of the imagination. And the more you study, the more you realize how humble you have to be. Because in studying and learning, you never feel adequate. I heard an older evangelist say one time, he had talked to a young evangelist and he said, you've been doing this for 40 years. 
When do you stop being nervous? He said, the day you stop being nervous is the day you ought to just stay sitting down. Because there's always that understanding of the importance of the role. If it is never an indication that you understand that, then you have to go back and you have to ascertain why. No one has the skills to conquer everything. No one has the knowledge to answer every question or to deal in every situation. But many pastors, it seems, have lost the yearning to become more knowledgeable in the Word. They will tell you how long that they've been doing what they're doing and why that makes them an expert. You know, a pastor without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit will never be an expert. And the way that you create that situation for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is to stay in the Word. I'm often reminded of the importance of that by how little it feels that I get to do that. Constantly looking for more time to be able to spend that extra time in the Word. And each pastor should realize that that is where the meat comes from. And oftentimes you may have heard older pastors say, you know, the more I study about God's Word, the more I realize that that message was more to me than the people I was preaching it to. And you will continue to see growth over the years in a pastor that's looking for the will of God. Proverbs 18, 15, if you'll turn over there. It was once said that it is the Word that saves them and it's the Word that will keep them. How true that is. You know, there are a lot of pastors looking for gimmicks to try to get people in the door. You know, the Word of God is not a gimmick. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It doesn't need, and God doesn't need a gimmick to get people in the house. And many pastors should realize that. How many pastors today are preaching the Word? Remember in the old days when people would say, you know, I went to church and I got my toes stepped on. That pastor walked all over it. He might as well have pointed a shotgun at me. Old pastor said one time, I'm not responsible for anything but loading the shotgun. Where it goes is where God directs it. You know, it's good for people to come to church every once in a while and go out feeling a little guilty. Feeling that they have heard what they needed to because even though these attributes and these qualifications fit a pastor, as you listen to them this evening, stop and realize they also apply to you. A pastor is just a person. He has an opportunity to do more than some, and maybe even less than others. But sometimes people want to put pastors on a pedestal. And because of that large list of expectations, and I'm not by any means saying that those expectations aren't proper, A pastor needs to be accountable. And you can see through the news today that there are many pastors who have gone beyond that level of accountability and felt they have the right to rule and to be a dictator. That's not the role of a pastor. And a pastor is accountable and should be held accountable and held accountable to the principles of God's Word. There are a number of people who have found themselves failing in such a degree that it requires them to step away from the ministry. On the other hand, I know of people who have stayed in the ministry who should have gotten out of the ministry a long time ago. That's not saying that pastors are perfect. They're going to make mistakes. They're people. But God has opportunities, and learning and knowledge is part of that. The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. You see, it's not only about getting the knowledge, but it's about seeking it. You know, You can go read a book. You can read an article. You can go to the internet and learn any kind of fact that you want to. Part of sermon preparation oftentimes is looking for facts. Being able to apply them and use that knowledge. But if all you're doing is looking for a fact rather than seeking knowledge, there's a large difference between the two. Seeking knowledge is saying, Lord, you teach me. Looking for information is saying, I can teach myself. You've got to realize really quick that teaching yourself is a very small portion because 
Knowledge and truth comes from above. And to be able to use that in a way that is necessary should be one that again keeps you ever humble, but ever seeking. It is necessary to be continually searching with a heartfelt desire to gain not mere facts, but life-changing truths. Facts are easy to find, but the truths that change your life take a little bit of looking for. A pastor must lead, and that includes both preaching and instruction. You instruct in a couple of different ways. One is you instruct through the Word. And when you preach that Word, you better make sure that you're preaching the Word. Your opinion doesn't matter. Your ideas, your thoughts, unless they're based on Scripture, they are simply that, your thoughts. That detracts in many instances from the power of the Word. If you sit and you listen to a person preach and they neglect to include Scripture, they just sit there and give you a a good talking to. You might want to sit back and consider what you're listening to. Because sooner or later it may be interesting and there may be a lot of facts in there, but if it doesn't contain the Word of God, then it's just somebody talking. You can turn on the television and listen to somebody talk. You can go stand in the lobby and listen to somebody talk. But what is relevant about it? How is it going to do more than just change your attitude, change your opinion, change your idea about something? What is it that's going to change your life? And that's the purpose that a pastor has to keep in mind. It's about changing, not just the actions. Anybody can change their actions. Do you know if you do this? Now, we won't do this to church members. But to kids, you know what? If you keep doing that, you're going to go stand in the corner. Some of our churches may not have enough corners for all the adults, huh? You might say, hey, I want that corner this week. But no, that's not what we do it for, is it? It's not about just changing the actions and saying, you better behave or else. It's about, here's why it's so hard to do what's right. Which is a continually kind of conflicting emotion. Doing right ought to be simple by this time, shouldn't it? But then why would we have to continue seeking knowledge if we ever got to the point where we were doing everything right Why would we need further knowledge? Not only does a pastor instruct through preaching, but instruction in the Word, and as well, instruction by his example. How many times have you seen a little child walk like their dad? They might not do it in quite the same way, but you can stand back and say, he's been practicing. He walks just like him. Or you'll listen and you'll say something just like your parents. You know, we need to be listening to God so we can talk more like our Father. So that we can act more like our Father. And a pastor has to realize that, as many of you have heard and it's been said for a very long time, a pastor lives in a glass house. And it seems that there are always a number of people standing outside with a handful of rocks. But again the pastor has to realize that he is accountable for his example. Realizing that he may fail from time to time. But how does he get back up? How does he move forward? And as you see him grow, it gives you the desire to grow as well. No pastor should walk in under the basis or the title of perfection. Everybody, you just do like I do. Just follow me. Listen to everything I say and you'll be just fine. He needs to be saying, let's listen to God together and see what He has for both of us. When you have the instruction through example, people will only learn a portion of what they hear, but they will also learn a great deal by what they see. pastor has to remember, you never know who's watching. And you never know who's listening. So everything that we do and say should be to the honor and glory of God. Knowledge is proven proven valuable in the ability to impart it rather than simply possess it. You ever met somebody who was so smart they couldn't explain anything? I remember having teachers in school and I'd scratch my head and I'm like, I have no clue. I did better reading the book than listening to that particular teacher. I I couldn't get anything. I mean, there was stuff written all over the board. The one time I remember the most, I had gone to college, 
And a friend of mine that I went to high school was in the class with me. And we both needed an elective. And of course, when you're a freshman in college, you don't want to take the really hard electives. You don't want to take something that's just really going to confuse you. You want something that you know you can pass. So we decided that we would both take basic math. Basic math with a preference towards elementary math education. That was it. I wasn't ever really good in algebra, so I thought maybe I can learn something that will move me along a little farther, and then I can take algebra later. So here we are sitting there the first day in elementary math education. I mean, I'm excited because the most we're going to do is, you know, 100 plus 100. It, it's not going to get too awful difficult, at least right away. The teacher came in and began to write things on the board that I'd never seen. And I thought, well, he must be getting ready for his next class because there were a couple of different, you can tell how long ago that was, we actually had chalkboards. But they wrote on the chalkboard, and uh, I looked at my friend, and she looked at me. I said, are we in the right class? I think so. And we both checked our pieces of paper and our schedule, and we were. So he turned around, and with a big smile on his face, he goes, I know some of you thought this was going to be an easy class. Kind of hit home. And then he said, but the way we do it here is we start with trigonometry and work our way backwards. I could not find a little pink slip fast enough. I've got to get a different glass. You know, and so it wasn't his fault that I wasn't going to understand what he knew. He could have probably helped me to understand it, but at that particular time, I really didn't have the desire. And that's the way it is, I think, with pastors sometimes. They have the knowledge. But for whatever reason, sometimes it just doesn't get beyond their knowledge and become usable. You know the greatest example of imparting knowledge in Scripture? It was Jesus Christ. An insurmountable level of knowledge, yet look at how simple it was. Every parable had a definite meaning, a definite purpose, and was so easily understood. The goal of a pastor should be able to take Scripture and make it understandable. Now, granted, there are going to be varying levels. Have you ever thought of how many different people are in a congregation? How many different levels of those expectations that we mentioned earlier exist? You have those that are still babes and need to be fed the milk, need to be taught the basics, but then you've got the folks who have been around for a while. They need a big hunk of meat. They need something that's going to get them to increase in their knowledge as well. But it's amazing how God can take His Word and meet the needs of everybody listening. When we look at 2 Timothy 2 and verse 18, one of the things we realize is we also have to have experience. We're not just talking about experience as a pastor or enough schooling to be what you need to be the minute you step onto the platform. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Experience will aid in staying on the right path. You consider all the experiences that a pastor goes through. God uses each of those to mold that pastor and to equip him for things that he's going to face in the future. But there will be opportunities for God to equip through the experience. Some are great experiences. Some are sorrowful experiences. The first time you have to walk into a room and try to comfort a family who's just lost someone. I learned quickly, you just can't do it. I used to get so upset with myself because I didn't have the words. I just felt so inadequate and still do. But I had to realize that apart from God, I don't have the words. But it's experiences like that that help you learn. But one of the other experiences that you have to keep in mind regarding pastors especially is, have they experienced the power of God in their life? 
Can you see God working in them and through them? Can you see things that you haven't seen before after you've heard a pastor say, I want you to pray with me about this. There isn't a joy that exists that can equal that of knowing that God is working in your life apart from the joy of salvation. But to know I prayed for that and Lord, you saw that as a need and you answered a prayer, not just because it was my prayer, but God, it was my desire to see you work. You've met the people who will say, I'll pray for you. But your pastor should be one that when he says, you know what, I'm going to pray for you about that. And from time to time we will say, you know what, let's not even wait to pray about it. Why don't you step over here to the side if you've got a minute and we'll pray about that right now. When you get a little note during the week from the pastor that says, hey, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. You know, those are the things that you begin to see as experience. When you are allowed to experience how God works through what you see in the pastor. Not only experiences, but one of the shepherds that was noted was called watchful. Proverbs 27, 23, if you'll turn over there. What a great picture when you consider the watchful oversight that should be evident in a pastor. Not just standing off and looking across the horizon and, and seeing the heads of a flock of sheep, but knowing that each sheep in that flock is an individual with individual needs, with individual fears, with individual concerns, and meeting each of those. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. A pastor has a special interest not only in the flock, but in the individual that makes up the flock. He has an interest in their safety, not only to provide a safe place and a safe heaven, haven, but also a place where you can go and say, I have a need. And you feel confident that He's not only interested in your need, but your need is safe with Him. You know, a pastor should never use someone as an example. A pastor should never share pertinent information with someone else. Because as someone in a congregation, there come those times in your life when you just don't know where to go. I've had people come to me many times and say, I don't know who to talk to about this. I don't know if you want to help me or not. But I've got a need. That pastor's heart should be broken at that time. Attentive to that need. Understanding of the individual. You're all different. Everybody's different. Uniquely made by God Himself. Some people have been hurt by pastors. Some people have been mistreated and misunderstood. And one of the things that a pastor should have is a heart for the flock. A heart for their, their individual needs. A tenderness of heart. An attentiveness to the needs. You know, a good pastor will know there's a need before you come to him with a need. Not in every situation because the pastor's not there for everything. But have you ever looked at somebody even in the congregation and said, you know, it just looks like there's something wrong. Again, what greater opportunity does a pastor have than to come and say, hey, is everything all right? Are you doing okay? You know what the typical answer is? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. In other words, code is, I don't want you to know. It ain't none of your business. But you know what? There's a great opportunity that exists when those needs arise. Because God put that shepherd there for a reason. Titus 2.7 says, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Sincerity is important. Any pastor can talk. Any pastor can make a great message. But can't you tell when somebody's sincere? And that should be evident. Sincere not only in their service to you, but sincere in their service to God, because in the sincerity of the service to God comes the knowledge 
comes the experience. Comes the watchful eye. And the sincerity with others. Do they put their flock first? Have you ever met a selfish pastor? He might be sitting there thinking, well, you're a pastor. Why are you talking about pastors? Because just like people, there are a lot of different kind of pastors. And some lack sincerity. They see their position as a job. Got to go to work today. And therefore, they treat it like a job. They don't go out of their way. They don't go above and beyond the call of duty. They, they may even send all of their 12 assistant pastors to do what they should do themselves. But what you need to understand is that that sincerity, again, is an attribute bred by God. In all things, showing thyself of a pattern of good works, uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. That's a command from Scripture. But again, let's not just limit it to pastors. Because should not everybody be sincere in their service? Not only do they put the flock first, but is their love a sacrificial one? Evident by their attention to the needs of the flock. When they know there's a need, are they attentive to the need? Are they trying to help with the need? Or at least find someone who can help? Or are they more prone to leave it at, I'm going to pray for you? Because sincerity in that comment is evidenced by what goes with it. Do you walk away going, I really think he's going to. I really realize and know and I trust that he will pray for me. Or do you walk away going, yeah, heard that before. But isn't it great when, as we mentioned earlier, when that prayer, is, that prayer request is put forward and then you see the answer to that prayer? You see God working. And as God works, that sincerity should grow. Sincerity is often coupled with dedication. But it's also necessary to realize that sometimes sincerity isn't always well received. Sincerity says there is a need, and I know there's a need, and here's what God's Word says about that need. You ever go in and ask somebody for advice, maybe even a pastor? You didn't really like what he told you? But then you kind of went home and you, you thought about it a little bit. You know, I didn't like what I heard. I may not even really like the way it was told to me. But you know, I did some checking in Scripture and it was true. You see, sincerity offers truthfulness. Truthfulness sometimes hurts. We have this mistaken thought process that honesty just means you're going to make me feel better. When a question starts off, now can I be honest with you? That means you might expect something other than. But that's where sincerity demonstrates itself. There's something I need to tell you. I want to tell it to you in love. But let's look at what God's Word has to say about it. And the sincerity of God's Word will shine through the pastor's sincerity. The sincerity demonstrated through love will allow the one in need to understand that sincere heartfelt desire. It's not my desire to hurt you. But as a shepherd, when that sheep comes and it has a wound, Sometimes the treatment of that wound is going to hurt. And if a sheep could talk, it might say, why are you doing this to me? This hurts. I came to you because I wanted to feel better. Sometimes that's a painful process. But on the other side of it, one can look back with heartfelt honesty and say, they were sincere in what they told me. They were sincere in trying to meet my need. They were sincere in their transparency. A pastor can't wrap a cloak around himself and refuse to be transparent. It's that transparency that makes him real. That generates the sincerity. 
Now, that doesn't mean that everybody has to know every last little detail about the pastor. But if you know that he cares, and if you know that he's a man of God, and you know that there is a desire to serve God. You see, being a man of God is not an easy task. But it sure is a rewarding one. And again, that humility that says, I'm not there yet. I'm still trying. I'm still studying. And I still want these qualifications to be associated with my name. Being a pastor is not a personality contest, but it's a godly commitment. You may not always be popular. You may not be the best-known pastor in the United States or even in your community. But God knows who you are. He knows your needs. He knows the expectations. And He knows your desires. The Bible doesn't only stipulate pastors be holy even as I'm holy, does it? Sometimes pastors kind of get stuck in that spot. But that's a command to all of us. And one of the parts of experience that a pastor enjoys is the opportunity to learn, not from just the Word, but from the members of his flock. To be able to be taught and to grow together That's what builds unity. And in the churches and the ministries that lack that unity, oftentimes it can be associated with one fact. The pastor didn't have the desire to grow closer to those. Now, oftentimes there's a debate and a discussion about, well, how good of friends can I be with the pastor? And there's always kind of a little line, isn't there? And that's for protection in a lot of ways. It doesn't mean the pastor can't be a friend. But it's a situation where sometimes people feel like they, you know, they kind of get on a first name basis, if you will. And, hey, you know, Jim, come over here and I want to talk to you. There's also a level of respect. That's the pastor. Not because the pastor needs to be called pastor, because it has to be the title on his door. but because the shepherd wants to be a shepherd. I trust that you have gotten a blessing tonight and seen some things that maybe we've seen before, but it's good to be reminded of. What do you expect in a pastor? Are those expectations based on God's Word? And do you see those expectations for the knowledge and the experience? the watchfulness and the sincerity, do you also see those as opportunities in your own life? Are you seeking the will of God? One of the greatest opportunities to grow in that unity, because a pastor is a pastor and there may be disagreements from time to time, how many of you, and you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you have seen or had disagreements with a pastor? And the pastor was unapproachable. To anyone that's been around for any length of time, that's a definite possibility. And nine times out of ten, it doesn't end well. But when both are able to look at Scripture and both are able to say with honesty and sincerity, there's an opportunity here. Satan loves those opportunities because he knows that nine times out of ten, something bad's going to happen. Wouldn't it be great to be able to reach a point where everybody understood the qualifications, but they saw it as a joint effort? What a blessing it is to be in a church where that unity exists. Not every pastor has that privilege, and I consider it a blessing. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for the constant reminder of what it means to be holy, to be godly, to have knowledge, to seek knowledge, to have experience. Experience that shows that there's a relationship with you. 
Lord, experiences that help us grow, keep us watchful, and humble us to the point where we remain sincere in all that we do. We just pray that you would keep us ever mindful of that, keep our hearts tender. Guide us and direct us so that we together could do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes you just end up looking and saying, Lord, what do I get to learn next? But when you learn that, the same question comes up. And it is a never-ending process of continuing to learn. But what greater thing do we have to learn about than God Himself? Extended, reaching from God's throne, free to all who will be. Grace for every sinner, enough for every soul to be saved and stand with the redeemed.